When I was a little girl, I would watch the iconic Audrey Hepburn as Eliza Doolittle over and over and over again. And there she was, fanning herself with a piece of cabbage, like the Duchess of Trash, trotting around Covent Garden. And I wanted to be her. Looking back, Eliza's life seemed so simple. What she wanted, so easy. I mean, there was Eliza singing about such attainable things. For instance, how lovely it would be to have a chair. I mean, I've never known anyone who didn't have a chair. <laughs> she, she wanted just to be warm and to be loved, and of course to eat chocolate. And it was small wishes that she sang about. I wasn't quite sure why she wanted, in her words, to sit absolutely blooming still. I would never budge till spring crept over my windowsill. Why she would welcome voluntary paralysis, I still don't know. But I guess it was her vision of what being part of the gentry really was. Regardless of this fantastical vision of richness, as I watched her dance through Covent Garden, I really did want to be her. If you've ever been there, you will know that Covent Garden is an eclectic place. It was at one point a convent garden for some monks, but when Henry VIII broke off from the Catholic Church, he seized all their lands and divided it between his friends. The word convent became bastardised into Covent. The Earl of Bedford built a market so he could make money and hence the birth of Eliza's flower market. To this day, Covent Garden is a mix of the magic of theatre, the danger of the pickpocket, and the decadence of history and tradition. When I'm in London, the first thing I do is go and walk around Covent Garden just to feel its energy. When I'm lost, it grounds me. Uninspired, she's my muse. To me, Covent Garden is the heart of the beast which we call London. So, where else could this tale of transformation be set? From age five, I wanted to act, and at nine, I embarked on a journey of full-time vocational performance training. I was small for my age. As you can see, I never really shot up. <laughs> and I even had to have my school uniforms required blazer especially made for me. I was in a class with kids two years older than me, and even though we were all performers, I was different. Because of my tiny stature, I could play younger than my age, and was auditioning and working a lot. There was jealousy, and I had very few friends. I spoke properly. Henry Higgins would have shaken my mother's hand, for he asks, why don't the English teach their children how to speak? And she had. And even though I had one grandmother who had grown up within the sound of the Bow Bells, that defines you as a true Cockney, if you don't know, and one grandmother with a strong Italian dialect, I spoke much more like my kind Mr. Pickering type grandfather. Sounding like the posh kid definitely didn't help me fit in with my year. I wasn't so much bullied as ostracised from most groups because I just didn't fit in. I was younger, smaller, and I spoke differently. And there was only one of those things I could actively change. So realising that, I began subconsciously a reverse Eliza. <laughs> It had been a few years and I was glottal stopping, dropping H's and then all my TH's were F's, so it was like not Arthur, but Arthur, right? So I had a truly lazy London sand and in this world I fitted. When I was 19 I got the opportunity of a lifetime and I was cast in the BBC flagship programme EastEnders <laughs> as a series regular. And it was set in the East End of London and it was watched by 28 million people, which in the UK meant that at that time one in three people watched my show. The opportunity was huge, and here I stayed for almost three years. But when I left the show, I realised that people defined me as my voice sounded. I was only to be seen as a working class Londoner, and it was very hard to be taken seriously as an actor. At 21, I'd been typecast. So I realised I'd lost my true voice, and I set about to find her again. I worked for months with this brilliant dialect teacher that I met at the Royal Academy, and in one lesson I teared up because I just didn't like the way I sounded. The way I spoke now repelled me. I realised the nine-year-old me was wrong. I mean, I was nine. What, what judgments were correct at that age? My accent needed an immediate change. I painstakingly worked 
repeating lists of words, retraining the muscles in my mouth, vowel charts, tongue twisters. It was like the film montage. I didn't swallow any marbles, but eventually I did it. I had won my battle with my voice. I was grounded. I was happy. Oh, I was found. I started to become intrigued by the way we form sound. I became fascinated as to why a person's geography or class secures a sound further back or forward in the mouth. I realised, hang on a minute, I may have been Eliza, but now I'm Henry Higgins. <laughs> Without the arrogance, the classism and the lack of slippers. <laughs> I travelled across the globe to America and when I planted my feet firmly on American soil, the real journey began. I was told that I had to be American when I entered the room and my American accent just didn't cut it. Don't get me wrong, it was good, but I apparently sounded too East Coast with my flat A's. I was lacking sufficient R colouring. So off I went searching for guidance in this land where yet again my voice made me other, different and defined me as to not belong. I found a brilliant voice teacher and embarked on this time finding my American voice. After repeating the sounds over and over, just like Eliza, I'd got it, by Jove, I'd got it. But, now, I don't know if any of you have ever studied accents, but to work on a script with specific lines that you can mark up and practice, it's one thing. But to improvise as an alternate version of yourself, that's hard, really hard. <laughs> any minute I could slip. And like Eliza's first trial, influenza done her in. <laughs> so I found a great technique is to invent a character who could embody me so that when I speak in an accent, I become someone else and I don't judge myself. Meet Sally, my American alter ego. Hey, I'm Sally and I work as a paralegal in an office downtown. <laughs> I wear pencil skirts and I drink too much coffee. I have some power, but not as much as I deserve considering what I do here. <laughs> and never one to sit still, I travel to the land down under and that was even worse. Now, don't get me wrong, I love Australians, but they really just want Australians. <laughs> so again, off I went to the dialect classes and during those painstaking hours of lip rounding exercises and being labelled with an inflexible tongue, I found Sue from Woolloomooloo. How you going? Yeah, I'm getting better. My breath stinks and my feet smell, but that doesn't really matter because my attention's on that ibis bird that I want to make a docker about. <laughs> my brain is like a Rolodex of voices that I shuffle through and at first they were all jumbled, so I made these characters so I can just go <clears throat> straight there. There's the ever so posh girl, Glenda, who really can't deal with anything in life. It's a mystery how I got dressed in the morning. <laughs> And then Martha, my northerner. I've told you before not to eat your sandwich before midday. We have, we have lunch in this house, not brunch. <laughs> Got Jolie from Jamaica. I'm a superhero fan. I can't wait to watch the new Wolverine movie. I tell you, I love me some Logan. <laughs> My Essex bird, Tracy. Things are lovely and brilliant. I have been told that I'm not the sharpest knife in the drawer, which is lovely and brilliant, I think. <laughs> and I love becoming Patty. I'm direct and I hate using the phone. Hello? Hello? God damn it, Beverly, is that you? Is this a butt dial? Oh, Frankie, I thought you were Beverly. Hello? Hello? And there are many more. <laughs> so here I stand, undiminished, part glorious gutter snipe, part tenacious teacher, part bimbling friend, but holy Layla. Someone's head resting on my knee, warm and tender as he can be, who takes good care of me. Well, who doesn't want that? Who doesn't want to be in love with someone that they feel safe with and looked after by? So maybe, just maybe, there's a little bit of Eliza in us all. Oh, but do remember, 
to remind the little girls around you who dream of the rags to riches tale of the princess how it's so much better to be queen. Oh. <laughs>